Mount Wilson uh, and welcome. We'd like to start this morning with a, an announcement that next week, next Sunday, we're hoping to be able to have our service open and at nine o'clock will be our first service for people that wear masks and don't and need to be protected by others wearing masks. Um, approximately 9.45 a.m. that time will be finished and we will totally wipe down surfaces in the church and the doors and everywhere. Um, and then the next group will come in at 10.15 and that, that service is for people who are comfortable without the masks. Uh, you'll be receiving a letter about that this week and we're going to give it a try and follow the social distancing rules that were that are recommended to us and we'll see how it goes. But it'll be nice to have people back here in the pews to look at when I preach again. This morning as we gather around the fire, we're watching the colors that ebb and flow from one into the other. May we see the spirit enter in through mystery and color. Let us see the Holy Spirit at work in others and in ourselves. Help us to grow our fire to share the Spirit's movement within our church, our community, and our world. Let us pray. We're waiting for your presence, God, patient like a lover sitting by the telephone, waiting for the voice of their beloved, attentive as a farmer watching clouds for rain, waiting for the parched soil's relief, intent as a child standing by the road, waiting for the parade to appear, empty as a satellite dish scanning the heavens, waiting for a message from the stars, poised as the still arms of a windmill, waiting for the wind's inspiration, open as the wide sand beach, waiting for the tide's embrace. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. I would like to open with a poem. It's called The Word of God by May Stein. When you are down and feeling blue, ask and it shall be given to you. When there are troubles on your mind, God says, seek and you shall find. Knock and his doors will open within. Ask our God will wash away your sin. You will receive if you, for you will receive if to God you ask, and if you seek, you shall find your task. God is love, and love God is. With much happiness and bliss, his love is real and forevermore. Knock, and God will open the door. How I know, thus what I say, reading the Bible as I pray, and onward living as I go, the word of God has told me so. Let us now read from the word of God. The scripture today is 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 13. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the, manif the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are works of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. The body is a unit, Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, 
whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. This time we're going to um, just share at home or um, with God our joys and our concerns and I have to admit that next week's opening is a little bit of a concern for me um, and I'm sure you're concerned as to the safest uh, way to return to worship however it's also a joy to be able to see people again um, and to worship together uh, we still continue to lift up people in our prayers that are struggling with physical needs or emotional or spiritual or uh, even financial needs. So we ask that you remember them in your prayers this week and just pray for our opening for next week that we do it in a way that glorifies God but also is safe for those to attend and worship in. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. O oh God of the stillness of these moments, we come to you. You're as near to us as our own breathing, as our own innermost thoughts, as our own deepest yearnings. You meet with us here. Can we also meet you, our God, in the ordinary paths of life? Do we see your face in the faces of persons around us? Our confession is that we often miss your presence in the busyness of life. Forgive us when our eyes are blind or our hearts are hardened to your everyday presence. Clear our vision this day, Lord, that we may find you more clearly in laughter and in tears, in celebration and in sorrow, in the freshness of childhood, in the vitality of youth, in the productivity of midlife, and in the integrity of older age. O oh God, help us to see you in all of our life. Today, as we gather as part of Christ's body, we pray for each other and for all that we bring. Some of us are celebrating family visits, birthdays, anniversaries, or milestones that are reached. Be with us as a special guest in their joys and celebrations. But some of us are experiencing the pain of illness or uncertainty or despair. Healing and hope seem far removed 
from that present moment, but grant, O oh God, the sure knowledge that you too know the meaning of pain and despair, and you can be a close companion to us. God of all peoples and of all creation, we also bring concerns that reach far beyond this place of worship. O oh God, touch us where we're unfeeling and uncaring. Prod us where we are apathetic or stubborn. Nurture us when we're slow to catch on. Pick us up when we stumble and fall. Challenge us to live as your children. Amen. I got a mind to do right. I got a mind to do right. I got a mind to do right. children. My story this morning is on Let Your Light Shine. I brought some different lights to show you. Like I use this when I start a fire outside at the fire ring. And see that little light? And then you've got, you know, the flashlight. And I'm sure many of you guys have flashlights and you like to probably play with them at night. And if you ever come to my house, I have a lot of solar lights and I did a thing this year we are a kind in the woods and I'm limited to what plants I can plant so I put 20 solar lights through the woods and you see how that shines so if you ever get a chance tell your parents to take you for a drive about 8 30 at night drive past my house and you'll see all these lights lit up in the woods and then this is always my favorite I have these all over my deck and they're all different colors. Just kind of reminds me of lightning bugs in a jar. Anyhow, these are different lights that can shine. Matthew 5, 15 and 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Let's see, good works, like helping around the house, or maybe helping with a brother or a sister. How about holding the door open for someone, helping a neighbor, or an older person. There's so much we can do to show good works. When we do this stuff, we please Jesus and God. Jesus called Christian disciples the light of the world. That is you and me. Why is it important to let your light shine? It's important for all Christians to let their light shine because that is the way in which they can bear witness for God and bring others to church. Now there's gonna be a little YouTube song coming on 
And so I want you to pay attention to that, sing along, and have a good time. Now let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And we do think of our girls and boys that can't be with us. I know by the time we see you, you probably will have all grown and we won't maybe not recognize you, but we miss you and we send our love to you. So just be with them through this, this day and through this week, Lord. And I bless it in the holy name. Amen. We can always use prayer in whatever we do and every day. So we recognize that we're standing in the need of prayer many times. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, but my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's me, it's a me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's a me. Oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the deacon, not the elder, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the deacon, not the elder, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, O oh Lord. Um, scripture lesson is for Pentecost. Today is Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. And looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 3 to 13, I read it in the message version, and I thought it makes a lot more sense to me in that, and I'll be reading that to you. What I want to talk about now is the various ways God's spirits get worked into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you are doing, just doing it because everyone else did. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt <clears throat> anyone to say, Jesus be damned, <clears throat> nor would anyone be inclined to say, Jesus is master, without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's very... <clears throat> God's various expression of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but they're handed out one by one by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. You can easily, <clears throat> you can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your own body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. 
It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. That is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. This is, <clears throat> each of us is now a part of the resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, the labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. Matt Slick writes, the Holy Spirit is almost the forgotten member of the Trinity. Christians know that he is a member of the Godhead, but too many Christians know very little about him. Is the Holy Spirit a force like radar? Is he alive? Or is he a person like the Father and Son? Though many think they know, a lot do not. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Christ Delphins teach that he is a force like radar. They're wrong. The Mormons teach that he is a male personage of flesh and bone. Actually, the Mormons teach that the Holy Ghost is a God. The male personage and the Holy Spirit is the presence of the God like Father. But they also are wrong. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. The Trinity is the doctrine that there is only one God in all creation, all time, and all places. This one God exists as three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is not the same person as the other, yet there are not three gods but one. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the, is the Father and the Son. But remember, there are not three gods, but one. It should be obvious that the Holy Spirit has self-identity, is aware, and is not merely a force, because a force doesn't speak, love, grieve, and have a mind of its own. But the cults tend to ignore these verses and tell us that the Spirit is nothing more than some presence or power. He's the third person in the Trinity. He's the one who applies the redemptive work of Christ to the believer. He is the one who convicts the world of sin, who teaches and anoints. But the Holy Spirit is also humble because he points to Jesus. Therefore, anyone who is truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit will likewise bear witness of Jesus. Okay, so what is the devotional aspect here? It's simple, the Holy Spirit indwells you and convicts of righteousness and sin. The Holy Spirit is very active in working in your lives as Christians to bring you closer into a relationship with Jesus. We should know more about the one who makes so much possible with our Savior. When I was reading a devotional from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association entitled Believe in the Holy Spirit, I found this story to be kind of helpful to someone new in the faith. Walter Knott uh, tells the story of a little boy who had recently received Christ. And he's talking to his father and he says, Daddy, how can I believe in the Holy Spirit when I've never seen him? I'll show you how, said the father who was an electrician. Later, Jim and his father went to the power plant where he was shown the generators. This is where the power comes from to heat our stoves and to give us light. We can't see the power, but it's in that machine and in the power lines, said Father. I believe in electric electricity, said Jim. Of course you do, said his father, but you don't believe in it because you see it. You believe in it because you see what it can do. So likewise, you can believe in the Holy Spirit because you can see what he does in people's lives when they are surrendered to Christ and possess his power. When reading through the Bible, it seems like the people had a fundamentally different relationship with God than my own or many people that I knew. I believe that a living God has uniquely designed our stories before and after conversion 
to teach us about him and prepare us for ministry. He has given particular experiences, passions, skills, and gifts. We can see the Holy Spirit's presence in many ways through scripture, our spiritual gifts, the work of the church, and our life circumstances. In Ephesians 2.10, it says the creator has a specific plan for each person's life, and he's arranged our talents, abilities, and circumstances to fit with these individualized goals. Charles Stanley says when we connect with our God-given purpose, we feel deep satisfaction and great joy. However, it's important to understand that we can't achieve the Lord's goals on our own. Only by his strength and direction are we able to succeed. In John 16, Jesus warned us that trouble is an integral part of life in this world, but easily forgetting how weak we are, we tend to take our challenges in our own strength and resourcefulness. Human nature wants to use its own power to tackle life single-handedly and then take credit. So when temptations and trials, criticism and gossip and persecution assail, many of us have the tendency to go into high gear and try all the harder. For a while, life may actually seem good this way, but in the long run, self-reliance causes a mess. It also interferes with the fulfillment of God's purpose. The truth is, we sometimes have to experience failure in order to realize our complete dependence on God. He lovingly breaks our pride by showing us that we cannot live fully without following the Spirit's guidance. Have you surrendered yet to the Holy Spirit's control? Acknowledge your weakness and recognize his power his omniscience and wisdom. The Lord doesn't call you to live the Christian life, which is a human impossibility. Rather, he wants you to yield control and let him live his life through you. Do we realize the times when the Holy Spirit's at work in our lives? And oftentimes we don't until you've gone through an event and later reflected on what happened. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Lewis Smedes taught at Fuller Theological Seminary once and wrote about why we need to wait on that Holy Spirit. He says, waiting is our destiny. We wait in the darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait for a happy ending that we cannot write. He listed seven steps for effective waiting on the Holy Spirit. One is to begin by quieting your own spirit. God doesn't always come in dramatic ways like he encountered Moses on Mount Sinai or Paul on the Damascus Road. Be willing to listen to the gentle whisper of the spirit that Elijah heard. Number two, open up your life totally to Jesus. Lift your heart toward God. Three, seek the truth about yourself. Think about what you do that falls short of the Christ-likeness and ask for forgiveness. Then move to eliminate those behaviors. Four, ask the Holy Spirit to shine his convicting light on any tucked away hatred and bitterness in your heart. Ask for forgiveness and cleansing for those attitudes. Invite the Holy Spirit to take control of your schedule, your agendas, your timetables, and your calendars. Six, realize that waiting on the Holy Spirit doesn't mean endless or aimless thumb twiddling. As you wait, do all things in a fitting and orderly way. And finally, number seven, yearn to sense the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. In your mind's eye, visualize that he has come and is present.
Rick Warren tells us that God wants you to trust his guidance, so he sent you a guide. When you became a believer, God placed the Holy Spirit within you. And he's been teaching you ever since to listen and to respond to the Holy Spirit's counsel. The Holy Spirit is your guide, one who walks with you along the way. He knows every step of the journey and understands the blessings and the dangers ahead. He knows where you've been and where you're going, and he knows the best, best path to take. This is an important issue to understand because God never intended for you to figure out the steps of your journey without him. In truth, how you get on mission and how you succeed at your mission are God's responsibilities. Your responsibility is to seek his guidance and obey his directions. Your job is to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. His job is to set your path straight. You don't have to know the reason for everything, and there's no requirement that you figure it all out before you complete your mission. You just need to trust and obey. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Think of the last time you felt led by the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit work in your life to show you which, which way you should go? What plans for your journey indicate you may be attempting a self-guided tour as opposed to relying on the experienced guide, the Holy Spirit? Brian Peterson wrote in a commentary that when the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, He's talking about the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. And what this means is that within the believer is an indescribably rich power source. The Spirit works through people to get done what's impossible for them to accomplish alone. In fact, the Bible says that he can do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And Paul certainly proved that with his prolific ministry. On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with the disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' closest followers had seen him betrayed, crucified, and raised from the dead. They had been with the Lord after his resurrection. They touched his scars, shared meals, and heard his voice. They had an incredible story to tell, and the world desperately needed to hear their message. However, they lacked one crucial ingredient to begin their mission. They did not have the Holy Spirit. Wait, no matter how well we think we may be ready to do great things for God, we must remember that without the power of the Holy Spirit, we're not ready to begin. What is God calling you to do that's far more abundantly beyond all you think you can achieve? Stop making excuses and get to work. Within you lies untapped potential, not your own strengths and abilities, but the unlimited might of the Holy Spirit. His power will be unleashed in response to your acting on faith. Today is the birthday of the church, Pentecost. What does it look like to be people of Pentecost, to those claimed by the Spirit? In the cultural buffet that's offered under the sign of spirituality, this passage from 1 Corinthians makes some important claims about the Spirit through which the church lives and the shape of faithful spirituality. Paul's discussion begins in verse 3 by insisting that the undeniable sign of the Spirit's activity will be confession of Jesus as Lord. The Spirit brings faith itself and specifically faith focused on Jesus as Lord. At this point, Martin Luther was deeply Pauline when he wrote in the small catechism, I believe that my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but instead the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel and enlightened me with his gifts. 
Paul connects the Spirit to Christ so that the true manifestations of the Spirit are those which demonstrate that this is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit leads the believer to join in Jesus' own prayer and cry out, Abba, Father. Thus, Christ himself becomes the measure by which genuine activity of the Spirit can be identified, and all who confess this faith are under the power of the Spirit. This is a radically inclusive claim. As far as the Spirit's concerned, there will, no, will be no room for the categories that culture might use to divide the haves from the have-nots, the Jews or the Greeks, the slaves or the free. By the very nature of faith as a divine gift, the Spirit has been and continues to be active in all who confess that Jesus is Lord. Paul indicates how to understand the Spirit's activity in the church by his identification of the Spirit's work through the believers as gifts. The root of this word points to the nature of these gifts. <clears throat> and they are the result of God's grace at work in the church. All believers are given such gifts, and notice it says, everyone and each. To be gifted by the Spirit's not something that happens to some believers, but not to others. Paul never gives us the impression that he expects some people in the church to be the ones who are ministering, and that there are others who simply minister too, because they haven't been given gifts of any of the Spirit's gifts. However, it may seem as though the gifts that Paul names here are uncomfortably absent from many of our congregations. While I rather regularly see evidence of wisdom and knowledge in the community where I worship, speaking in tongues and their interpretation has never happened there as far as I know. Healing certainly happens but usually through the mediation of doctors, medicines, and therapy. Miracles may happen, though spotting them usually means finding God hidden. In other, in other words, we see as a normal event. So where are the gifts of the Spirit? We might be more successful in spotting the spiritual gifts that Paul lists in Romans 12, 6 to 8, in ministry and teaching, exhortation and generosity, leadership and compassion. In my experience, when and if we talk to people in our congregations about their spiritual gifts, we tend to focus on these sorts of characteristics and talents rather than on the flashier items mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. That's not necessarily wrong. We rightly thank God for the talents and the abilities we have Yet it isn't quite right to simply equate talents with the gift of the Spirit either. There's something more involved than simple talent. Paul's central point about these gifts is made in verse 7, where he notes these gifts are given to each, of the, each for the good of the whole church. This allows room for us to rightly identify as gifts of the Spirit those talents that are informed by, summoned by, and energized by the spirit of the good of the church. We're not talking about being gifted individuals who have the talents required to get ahead and earn a good salary or the admiration of others. Paul wants the Corinthians to adopt a new way of looking at spirituality by seeing these abilities as a means through which God is at work it is that dynamic which transforms the talents into gifts of the Spirit, when by God's grace and power, those talents are reoriented away from us and our own interests, and when they become vehicles for God's love. They are truly the Spirit's gifts to the church. Believers are not simply individuals who are empowered and gifted by the Spirit. They're, in, they're interconnected parts of a single body, and it is to this image that Paul turns near the end of our passage. Others in Paul's culture used the image of the body to strengthen the hierarchy of society. Philosophers and politicians said that the human society was like a body, which had to have a head that told everyone everything else what to do. But of course, the elite get rich 
get to be the head or the stomach, and the poor need to keep working as the hands and the feet. Paul overturned this common use of the body image. He questions any assumption that some members of body are more important than others. In the body of Christ, behavior will not be determined by concern for honor and status, but by what builds up the whole body, by interdependence and by love. The work of the Spirit, correctly understood, will result in a unified body of Christ, not in competition or division. Since we all receive life and growth from the same flowing baptismal grace, we are, we are asked to provide our gifts and spread them and use them to, for the good of the church. Remember your gifts. If you have trouble naming your gifts, ask someone to help you. Talk with each other. Share your love and concern. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go forth from this service, may the wind of the Spirit startle your senses and blow through your life. May the fire of the Spirit scorch your complacency and light your way. And may the blessing of the Holy One, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer rest with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>